Welcome back to the Six Ps podcast. And today's episode, we're going to be looking at Fred Deguar's The Longest Memory and reading and analysing chapter two. Just to give you a brief summary, as the title of the chapter suggests, this is from Mr. Whitechapel's perspective, the plantation owner. It's a monologue and it is in first person with no quoted dialogue. And therefore, it reveals his inner thoughts, his feelings, and I guess to an extent, a bit of his stream of consciousness. Now, following the death of Chapel, he actually reprimands Whitechapel for not suppressing his son's belief around enslavement and freedom. He thinks that Whitechapel should have told him off for thinking that he could be free. We, of course, know that Whitechapel does try and remind him, but his son thinks he's better than that. He actually also blames Chapel as well to an extent too and that he actually deserves a punishment. However, Mr Whitechapel does question his views on slavery particularly when comparing himself to the other plantation owners and we'll actually get into more detail about that in a future chapter. However, after dismissing Whitechapel he then addresses Sanders Jr, the overseer who whipped Chapel to death. And he's probably more angry at him than he is at Whitechapel. And he finds him a substantial amount of money. He doesn't fire him, though, which is interesting in and of itself. Lastly, Mr. Whitechapel reveals that Chapel was, in fact, Sanders Jr.'s stepbrother, leaving him shocked and mortified, um, him in that case being Sanders Jr. He had no idea that Chapel was, in fact, his stepbrother and that his father, Sanders Sr., um, raped cook and we find out about that again when it comes to cook's chapter just a reminder as well about these characters with some very confusing names mr whitechapel is a plantation owner he's an enslaver whitechapel is someone who is enslaved so too is his son or stepson as we now know chapel so just a reminder about those three characters and making sure because it's very easy to get them mixed up obviously um, about these characters names thinking about chapter two i guess the key themes are family especially given the fact that Whitechapel, we find out loves chapel like a son even though he is not his biological son freedom and equality are definitely discussed as well particularly when it comes to the views on slavery which mr Whitechapel uh, questions and I guess power as well and the abuse of power which comes up through the character of both Sanders Jr. and also his father Sanders Sr. and also I guess the power that Mr. Whitechapel wields as well in this society and how he doesn't necessarily use his power like he potentially could and that's something we'll get onto a little bit later but now let's head to the reading of chapter two. Chapter two Mr. Whitechapel I leave the plantation for one night and a day. One night and and a day, that's all, and I return to virtual chaos. Overseer, you are supposed to supervise. Deputy, you are paid to work for me and do as I say on my plantation. Whitechapel, you may be the most senior man on this plantation, but you have overstepped the mark in your recent antics. Your son, God rest his agitated soul, has brought calamity on my head. He's dead through his own design. Thank God my wife and daughter were not present to witness the debacle. His action was rebellion of the most heinous kind. Had he survived, his life on this plantation would have been finished. You yourself have said that a slave who has tasted liberty can never be a proper slave again. You, Whitechapel, agree with me to contain your son's anarchic spirit. We agreed in this very dining room to protect him from himself by driving from his mind the foolish notions of freedom. Whitechapel, you failed. I trusted you, and you disappointed me. Tell me what am I to do with the plantation of disgruntled slaves? Sell every last man, woman, and child if you ask me. That's my inclination. Give you all up to the four corners of these states, and see how you fare. My acquaintances tell me I am too lenient. They tell me I fatten up slaves too much with large regular meals and decent quarters, and I work them too little. No, I argue back. On the contrary, a satisfied slave is a happy slave and a more productive worker. Treat them like equals, and they respond with nobility. Instead, 
What do I get, Whitechapel? Reassurances from you, and this effrontery from your son? I say his punishment was just, however ramshackle its execution might have been. Leave us now, Whitechapel. We have much to discuss, and let me hear that you have done everything in your power to influence your fellows to comply with the affairs of this plantation. Your son's death is a matter of deepest regret to us all, but in our view, he brought it upon himself. He may as well have taken his life with his own hands. You should have saved him from himself, Whitechapel. You were his guardian. Leave us. Remember, were it not for your seniority, there would be charges of insubordination brought against you for your behaviour towards Mr. Sanders. You owe him an apology. There. Close the door behind you like a good man. I don't have to watch Whitechapel. It's you two I have to watch. I pay you good money every month. But it doesn't seem to be enough to content a deputy. Where were you last night? Your habit of disappearing from the plantation as regularly as was reported to me may have cost you your job. Make the explanation good. Damn good. And my overseer, my right-hand man, my eyes and ears and my mouth when I am absent, because I can't be in two places at once. What manner of management do you call the shambles of last night? I am lucky to have returned to the plantation at all. Had I gone north with my wife, my son and my daughter, what would I have come back to find? My home burned to the ground and my livelihood ruined, given the level of discontent that may have spread among my slaves. What was going through your head when you heard my orders to hold that rascal until I returned? Did you think you were better schooled in the management of slaveholding than I? Was it your intention to disobey my orders and come up with a better result? How can I be sure you will ever carry out my careful instructions again without a whim entering your head and causing you to deviate from this or that portion of it because it does not suit you? Or you fail to see the reasoning of it and deem it to be flawed and therefore amenable to your reform. Tell me why should I retain you when I can't trust you not to ruin me. Speak, man. Where is the tongue that told Whitechapel in no uncertain terms that my orders to hold his son were meaningless in your estimation of the situation? Who gave you the authority? How do you plan to redeem to me the cost of losing a slave in the prime of his working life? I will fine you, Mr. Sanders. You will repay to me every last cent of that boy's value. Do you understand? Were it not for the fact that our fathers worked together, you would be relieved of this job, Mr. Sanders. I'm roundly disappointed in you. Whitechapel is a good man. He has seen enough death without you taking his only son from him. He deserved better treatment. He knew our fathers for God's sake. He instructed you in the responsibilities of your post. What were you thinking about when you struck him and had his son whipped to death before his eyes? Is that the kind of man you take me for? that I will be pleased with this brutal form of management. Don't you think? I cry out of anger and disappointment. My fury will not result in revenge. You must understand. I see from your behaviour that the argument of my acquaintances that slaves should always be shown a stern, distant hand appears to triumph for my plantation over my own view. A view upheld at considerable expense and one held, I might add, by my father and your father, that the lot of a slave is miserable enough without being compounded by necessary hardships and cruelties. How long do you think that approach would work? These acquaintances, I don't call them friends for this very fact, run estates rife with all forms of rebellious behaviour on the part of their pitiable slaves. When is the last time I've had reason to order a public beating of a slave? Only the other week. I read in the Virginian that a man tried to shoot an apple from the head of his slave at some 20 paces. The terrified slave ran for the man's aim, and the man shot him for it. This inhuman display parading his discipline is a regular occurrence on these so-called tightly run operations. I tell you all the evidence supports my belief that as a long-term measure, it is a disaster. Contrary to their arguments, such rough handling provides rougher responses. The human spirit is passive in some, but nature shows us that it is rebellious in most. Africans may be our inferiors, but they exhibit the same qualities that we possess, even if they are merely imitating us. The management is best exemplified by an approach that treats them first and foremost 
as subjects of God, though blessed with lesser faculties, and therefore suited to the trade of slavery. If you cannot reconcile this approach of mine with your beliefs, then I must ask you to surrender your office as my overseer. If you hold what I have crudely outlined to be to you to be true, then you must admit that the events of last night were contrary to it, and accordingly were wrong on your part. My fine is therefore fair. There is much hard repair work to be done to win the obedience of the likes of Whitechapel again, but I grant you it must be done. I remind you that your father, before you did much to incur the total disobedience of Whitechapel, and you know to what specific incident I refer, without me having to re recollect the ghastly details. You've seen for yourself how the old man's behaviour has shown over the years since your father's death that he bears you not a shred of malice for that act perpetrated by your father against his wife. There is simply too much history between us all to justify what you did last night. Too much. What began as a single thread has, over the generations, woven itself into a prodigious carpet that cannot be unwoven. There is no good in pretending that a single thread of cause and effect exists now, when in actual fact, the carpet is before us with many beginnings and no end in sight. The only logical solution is to continue with this woven complexity and behave responsibly. That or we discard the entire fabric and begin to begin. Down that road lies chaos. Whitechapel lost his second wife to your father. You know that? She was pure and unsullied until he laid hands on her. Nevertheless, Whitechapel stayed with her after the birth of the boy. Sanders, steady yourself. Your father said you knew all there was to know. He assured my father of this fact. My father took this to mean that you were fully informed. Whitechapel raised the boy as his own. In all the years, he told him nothing of his forced conception. I thought you knew this. It would have been sufficient to prevent you whipping your own half-brother to death. Whitechapel should have reminded you. He must have thought you knew and did not care. All these years he kept the woman, no more than that, loved her, put the violation behind him, made her feel she was his and not your father's chattel. She bore him no children, not the son he coveted all his life, though blessed with a dozen daughters. Whitechapel would not have knowingly stood back and allowed you to whip your own brother to death. He would not. You see, no one was to talk about it, and with time it sank to the bottom of everyone's minds. My father died. Your father, Whitechapel's wife, it seemed all the people who were directly involved to whom it was important and painful were dead along with the shame, with the exception of Whitechapel. Whitechapel said nothing to his son. You saw the way they were together. You were supposed to know. You behaved like you knew. Differential towards Whitechapel and tolerant of his spirited son. My orders to hold him until my return were issued in light of these exceptional circumstances. Ordinarily, I would have let you run the plantation and hold dominion over the fate of a runaway. He was no ordinary runaway. I thought you knew. Your father was supposed to inform you, and that was the end of it. No one was to raise the matter ever again. The whole mess cannot be ended any more than it can be made as simple as it may have been at its inception. Your father's action and that of countless others before him and since ensured that. Whitechapel's longevity and living memory ensures that too. Our consciences, for God's sake, ensure it too. We must not allow this trade to turn us into savages. We are Christians. God should guide us in our dealings with slaves as he counsels us in everything else. Join me in a little prayer. Let us ask for advice and strength. We will pray and return to our affairs with God's grace by our side. All right, let's look at some key quotations. And I've picked out about 10 quotations which I think are worthy of analysis. The first one, you yourself have said a slave who has tasted liberty can never be a proper slave again. Here we see the embedded in systemic prejudice and racism within this 1820s Virginian society. Something stark about this particular quote, because there's so many quotes that sort of emphasize this, this is Mr. Whitechapel putting words in Whitechapel's mouth. 
that he himself holds this belief. And we'll come to a quote later on in the text, um, in this chapter, the metaphor of the thread and the carpet, and this notion that enslaved humans were taught this belief. They were taught to view themselves as inferior and unfree and shackled to this identity of being enslaved. And think about this notion of beliefs, how beliefs are passed on from one generation to the next. And even think about how this belief of Mr. Whitechapel is passed on to Whitechapel and how he tries to pass it on to his son, who unfortunately doesn't listen and as a result sort of dies. The second quote is also from Mr. Whitechapel. In fact, all these quotes are from Mr. Whitechapel, given it's from his perspective. My acquaintances tell me I'm too lenient. No, I argue back. A satisfied slave is a happy slave and a more productive worker. Treat them like equals and they respond with nobility. This is the inner conflict that Mr. Whitechapel finds himself is. He's in two minds. He wants to sort of treat slaves with respect and with dignity. You know, he has these views and beliefs which he sprouts, but his actions don't sort of suggest that. Um, particularly when it comes to, say, Chapel and Lydia's relationship, he's very much against that. So I think he is a little bit of a hypocritical character. And note throughout the text, he does contradict himself. We'll learn more about his relationship with the other plantation owners as well and how he's very different in one of the later chapters, the one, in fact, called Plantation Owners. The third quote, he brought it upon himself. You should have saved him from himself, Whitechapel. Here, Mr. Whitechapel blames both Chapel and Whitechapel for the death of Chapel. Note how Whitechapel himself blames himself for Chapel's death and the grief that comes from that. And the grief is a physical one. It's a physical pain that he sort of feels. And we know that given the last chapter, he explains that. Whitechapel is a good man. He deserved better treatment. Here we see again that kindness and compassion coming out from Mr. Whitechapel. Again, these are his words. These are not his actions. And I'm thinking very much about the seven stages of grieving with that. This idea of that words are all good, but action is needed. The word reconciliation doesn't really have any meaning or purpose, but an action does. So a nice connection there between these two texts. And the last one. Africans may be our inferiors, but they exhibit the same qualities we possess. Here we see that ingrained racism. That quote that Africans may be our inferiors is widespread throughout this society. They view them as subhuman. What I think is interesting about this quote is the word inferior. Consider Whitechapel's character. I wouldn't call him inferior at all. I'd call him superior to the others. He acts with compassion, kindness, dignity. Look at the way that he treats Cook. I mean... I definitely would think that he's the superior character within this text. The fact that he's considered inferior um, go, uh, really goes against um, this quotation. All right, four more quotes to look at. Their management is best exemplified by an approach that treats them first and foremost as subjects of God, though blessed with lesser faculties, and therefore suited to the trade of slavery. This is another quotation which demonstrates that really entrenched, ingrained, racist views. But have a think about some of the wording. It's a bit of a euphemism, you know. Are they suited to the trade of slavery or forced into slavery? Are they blessed with lesser faculties or more moral faculties? Again, when we think about a character like Whitechapel, I definitely would think that he is a bigger person. He's a better person than the others. And again, it's this hypocritical view. They consider themselves to be Christian and Christianity preaches values of, you know, treating people with respect, you know, treat others how I would have treated you, quote from the Bible, um, but that's sort of not what they, sort of how, how they act. The next quote is that metaphor that what began as a single thread has over the generations woven itself into a prodigious carpet that cannot be unwoven. Uh, we've gone through this in class a couple of times already, but it's that, entrenched view of both the enslavers and the enslaved who view being enslaved as part of their identity that's been inbuilt into them not just them currently but past generations as well and those beliefs and views cannot be undone the fabric of that carpet that prodigious carpet cannot be unwoven you cannot just remove those views and those values and those beliefs it's too entrenched within society into their psyche their identity is, and I'm talking about enslaved humans here, their identity as being enslaved 
is so strong that it cannot be broken. It forms part of their purpose and their identity. The penultimate quote, Whitechapel's longevity and living memory ensures that the value of memory. Um, I really like that quotation. The fact that it's got memory in there as well is really good. How important Whitechapel is and his memory in preserving that. And the last one, we must not allow this trade to turn us into savages. We are Christians that God should guide us in our dealings with slaves as he counsels us in everything else. So again, pinpointing the importance of Christianity in this not 1820s Virginian world, that they turn to Christianity for everything. Yet, again, they do not act in a Christian way. I think, again, they're quite hypocritical. Let's finish with some connections to the seven stages of grieving. I've got two here, but I want to actually touch on a couple more. The first one is the abuse of power. So Sanders Jr. and Sanders Sr. as overseas in the treatment of enslaved humans in comparison to law enforcement in the seven stages of grieving. So I'm thinking about the mugshot, which is the story of Daniel Vock and the story of a brother about the every woman's brother who, of course, is stuck in a cycle of poverty and crime and addiction and abuse. And I think the connection between how they are treated and how characters like Chapel and Cook are treated as well. A bit of a trigger warning, obviously, here when we're talking about Cook. Mr. Whitechapel talks about Chapel's, you know, being a forced conception. That's a euphemism for rape. And you need to be blunt about these things because that's how Cook was treated by Sanders Senior. And that will appear in the next chapter. But the way that is covered over, that sort of not really spoken about, that they try and cover it up and keep it hush hush. Again, the abuse of power, especially over those who are the most vulnerable in society. The next point just talks about the entrenched racism. So consider the metaphor of the carpet and that single sort of thread with perhaps the scenes like Invasion Poem or even you know one that doesn't get quite a lot is Murray Wants to Dress. Those ingrained racist beliefs and the notions of superiority really shine through there. And think about the way that Murray is treated and the way that she laughs it off. Whereas for the others, you know, for someone like Whitechapel, he needs to live in the belief that being subservient is the way to live, is the way to sort of remove these notions of freedom and equality away from him. A couple of other things I wanted to sort of raise was the quote on page 31 from Mr. Whitechapel. And he says it to Sanders Jr. How do you plan to redeem to me the cost of losing a slave in the prime of his working life? That I will find you, Mr. Sanders, and you will repay to me every last cent of that boy's value. When I look at that quotation, he sort of says, I'm going to find you and make up money that I've lost from Chapel and his enslavement. Reminds me of scene 16 and bargaining, that really short scene where the, every, every woman has the for sale sign in the red earth and says, what is it worth? Once again, we see, you know, someone who is enslaved as a commodity, as an object, as something to make money from, much like the indigenous people who were, you know, dispossessed from, from their land, from their culture. Again, that monetizing, that commodifying a human being and their land and that connection about how authorities abuse that power. Something else I guess you could talk about is the ethics. Do you think Mr. Whitechapel acts ethically? I would question that. He only finds Sanders Senior and he even claims that Chapel's death was his of his own volition. And the seven stages of grieving continually depicts the unethical actions towards First Nations people. There are so many scenes, I won't pick out one at the moment, but just some things for you to think about when making connections between the seven stages of grieving and the longest memory. <laughs>